This is Digital Pathology Today. Now here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. The world is changing, but that's not new to us, of course, as we're undergoing this transformation to digital pathology. We're talking with Michael Johnson, founder and CEO of Visicol, who specializes in digital pathology, 3D tissue imaging, and 3D cell culture assays and models. As we undergo this digital transformation, is it inevitable that we move away from the paradigm of human-focused approaches to microscopy interpretation to a more computer-driven and computational approach? What will this look like? Is it realistic? And how far away are we? The ability to multiplex has certainly been a game changer in the past couple of years. Of course, we're all familiar with three or four antibodies and an IHC cocktail, but what about the ability to do tens and even hundreds of antibodies or analytes with either IHC-based fluorescence or other modes of detection? What is the future potential of multiplexing? And what exactly is 3D imaging and confocal microscopy? How does it differ from traditional two-dimensional approaches? This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by JAV Advisors. With over 16 years experience, JAV Advisors focuses on business and management consulting for digital pathology and artificial intelligence in deployment within histology, pathology, and cytology laboratories throughout the world. Call 213-258-6268. For more information, JAV Advisors. Michael Johnson from Visical, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Really looking forward to catching up today. You've made quite a splash in recent years with Visical. So tell us about your early interests in uh, science and digital pathology. Absolutely. So, yeah, so my background, my undergrad uh, degree was from Muhlenberg College in biology. And my PhD work was at Rutgers University, focused actually on environmental sciences and biofuels. But in between grad school and undergrad, I worked at NASA doing remote sensing work, so different types of imaging projects from satellites and also planes. And it was through there that I got a passion for imaging. At first, you know, huge scales, so looking at the planet, looking at large areas of land, but really the same principles for digital pathology and imaging of tissues. And through my graduate work, I got involved with several tissue imaging projects. One of those turned out to be Visicol, which is the company that today I'm the CEO at and uh, really is very focused on imaging, digital pathology, and advanced cell culture assays. But for me personally, I've always been just super interested in science. As a kid, I was always building rockets and blowing things up and always just very interested in science and thought it was super cool. And today I'm fortunate to do that as my job and be able to lead a company that's really doing innovative and cutting edge research on a day-to-day basis. I hear that a lot, actually, and it kind of highlights that digital pathology is, if you will, one subset of imaging. A lot of people come from a background of aerospace, NASA, the military, where they were imaging things many, many years. And so I think a lot of the same principles and technologies certainly apply. And then as we move into, you know, biotech and life sciences, you know, then there's this added component of cells and organisms and tissue sections and so forth. And that's kind of where it gets really exciting for us. Tell us about the history of Visical. When you first started the company, what was the unmet need or what was the opportunity that you saw to enter the marketplace? That's a great question. So for for us, we started the company, I think, opposite to how most folks start a company. We had a, a really cool technology that was looking for a problem. So when we started the company, we were at Rutgers University. We were 25, 26 years old. And my co-founder, Tom, was working on his PhD with me. And he had developed a technology for making tissues transparent. So instead of taking a tissue block and slicing it into a bunch of ultra-thin two-dimensional slices, he had developed an approach where we could render that whole three-dimensional tissue transparent and actually image it in 3D. So instead of doing slide-based histology, which is what everyone does in the digital pathology space, we could image a whole mouse brain, a whole biopsy in 3D. Now, it's not useful for all research questions, but where you have a research question with a really heterogeneous and spatially complex tissue, imaging in 3D provides a lot of value. So that's how we originally started the company, was around this reagent. Uh, We started selling reagents and kits made in the basement um, to researchers all around the world. And we did that for about a year or two years to get a lot of traction. Uh, We developed this 3D imaging platform called Visicol Histo, 
that by 2018, after we started the company in 2016, was used by about a thousand research labs from around the world, and folks were publishing papers on how to image everything from um, you know, rat brains to whole organs and tissues in 3D. And we decided around late 2017, early 2018, to position ourselves as a, a service provider. There were a lot of companies that started reaching out to us to do imaging work. They didn't want to buy our reagents, they didn't want to buy our kits, but they wanted the answers and wanted the insights that you could get from using our 3D imaging platform that we had developed. And from there, we transitioned wholly into the contract research space, working with pharma and biotech companies on transforming their tissues into insights to answer different research questions, whether it was toxicology, pharmacokinetics, or efficacy of therapeutics. And through that process, we built out a huge suite of image analysis software, both for 2D and for 3D, and also for multiplex. And at the time, uh, you're talking 2016 to 2018, there were a lot of 3D imaging platforms for image analysis um, out there. There were a few that were starting to come out, uh, but for the most part, there wasn't a lot of off-the-shelf software. So we built out a huge suite of software to do digital pathology on really complex data sets. And um, yeah, we did that from, I would say, 2017 to 2018, 2019. And during that time period, we added in advanced uh, cell culture as well. So imaging organoids and 3D cell culture models through high content imaging. So today we generate just an enormous amount of imaging data and try to help our clients transform their tissues into large data sets and then mine those data sets for useful, uh, useful insights. We um, really don't want to give folks data. We want to give them a report that allows them to answer the research question. And today that's what we do with um, we have 15 of the top 20 pharma companies and about 60 uh, biotech and pharma companies as clients. So today that's where we operate. But when we started the company, it was really just a couple uh, guys in a cool technology and we we're trying to get it out there. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. So 3D imaging, clearly the world we live in is in three dimensions. Traditionally, or for you know the last hundred years or so, particularly medical pathologists looking through their microscopes are looking at things basically in two dimensions. It's easy to forget that, but then it also, you know, as pathologists gain more and more experience, that's part of the discipline or part of the practice is an old seasoned pathologist will maybe say something glibly to a young trainee, well, remember, this is actually something that's occurring in three dimensions, so we have to keep that in mind, right? So they're kind of playing that game in their mind if they're more seasoned or experienced. What are the practical uh, differences of 3D imaging versus 2D technological uh, considerations and, and you know what and practical considerations to keep in mind. So 3D, it's um, important to say it's not useful for all applications. I think everyone tries to say digital pathology is going to replace a regular pathologist and 3D is better than 2D, but those things really are not true. There's um, certain use cases where 3D is helpful, but a lot of use cases where traditional pathology and not digital pathology is better. So it really depends. But for us, where we focus with 3D imaging is on questions that you just can't answer with 2D. So if we're trying to image um, a retina, for example, it's very hard to mount a retina and image it. It's very complex also to try and slice uh, vasculature and get that in a two-dimensional slice and quantify branching or tuberosity or these more complex phenotypes. So we come in and try and help with those research questions. Or if we're looking at a really heterogeneous tumor or tissue sample, we want to get the whole picture of what's going on. That's where we're pulling in 3D imaging. Uh, so for those questions, it can be very useful. Um, but the practical considerations are that you need specialized imaging equipment. Most of the time we're working with confocal microscopy, but we also uh, have light sheet microscopy and can use that as well. So these are much more advanced and expensive imaging systems. You also have to make the tissues transparent. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do that. Um, you also have to use fluorescent labeling and get your antibodies to penetrate deep into tissues, which can be a problem as well. But if you're able to put all it together and you can generate imaging data, then the problem becomes how do I look at three-dimensional uh, imaging data. And moreover, it's usually three-dimensional multiplex imaging data. So the amount of data is incredibly large. And then distilling that down to something useful can be quite challenging. So usually for us, if we're looking at vasculature, we might do something like count how many branch points there are, or measure redundancy in a vasculature flow, or look at network analysis and how that's changing as a function of treatment, or how large blood vessels are shrinking, or small blood vessels are moving away. So it, it kind of depends on what the question is. 
Um, but we're trying to distill down that huge amount of data into something useful for our clients. Yeah, I think that's a key point. It kind of de- what what question are you trying to answer? Yeah, start there. Maybe could you give us your sense of what the future holds for three D imaging? Perhaps Do you see an expanded role in clinical practice and medical pathology for three D imaging, it, particularly as we move into this era of digital pathology, where we're perhaps going to have machines or computers being able to do things, taking away more of the routine work that human beings are not. And would three D imaging lend itself towards more of that approach? When we first started the company and we first developed the technology, we and our, our vision really was like, hey, let's jump right into the clinic and help save some people's lives through improving diagnosis. Problem was we were 25, 26 years old at the time, and uh, no one was giving us $10, $15 million of venture capital funding to do that because we had no publications, no data, no background. So we tried to leapfrog our way into where we are now. So we got into reagents and kits, which was not very capital intensive. We built traction and now we're in the preclinical space. And ultimately, we do want to move into the clinical space with our technology platform. We most recently were awarded uh, almost a $2 million NIH uh, grant to do that. Uh, The real question is, where does it fit in? Because everyone wants to say digital pathology is better. But we know from PAPNED and 20, 30 years of digital pathology that lots of folks have tried it. And for cost, for adoption, for all different types of reasons, it might not be better than what's being done today. So for us, really what's key is finding the question that can truly benefit from 3D. So if we look at a sentinel lymph node biopsy for breast cancer, for example, and we're better able to detect isolated tumor cells, well, that's cool. It actually doesn't matter because according to what the treatment practice is today, really anything above an isolated tumor cell and a micromet of a certain size, the patient is going to one treatment paradigm. So no matter how good we are and how accurate we are with 3D, it actually doesn't change what happens to the patient. So like from a technical standpoint, it's cool, but it really doesn't clinically matter. So for us, we've pinpointed a few key clinical questions where we can actually change uh, the diagnosis of patients. One example is for patients with, um, with metastatic melanoma, if you misdiagnose metastatic melanoma, patients are going towards a very passive treatment approach where if those are false negatives, which happens between 5 and 15% of the time for those folks, um, the results are terrible. The uh, reductions in quality adjusted life years are dramatic. And if you're able to reduce those false negatives, you have a very meaningful impact on the clinical outcomes for those patients because they're going to active treatment instead of passive treatment. So for us, it's finding those like killer applications where 3D is helpful. But it's definitely not all cancer. It's definitely not all research questions. It's a small subset of them. And it's finding those where you can have adoption, where there's a significant problem. And really, you can change the impact to the patients and what happens. It's not just you know, minor changes in cost or slight improvements in accuracy. It's actually dramatically changing what happens to the patient. That is the holy grail. How can we make an impact in, in patients' lives for the better? There clearly are uh, treatment paradigms. And I think there's also silos of pathology and radiology and listening to you discuss you know some of your technology and how it might be useful in visualizing retinas and things like that do you think we're going to be breaking down the the silos or the distinctions between pathology and radiology because on many levels we're just we're we're imaging and you know it's kind of a, mat, a matter of in vivo or ex vivo or we're imaging tissue and and do you see a convergence of the two particularly with the types of technology you're talking about It's funny because when you come at it from the outside and you look at those questions of looking at uh, radiology or looking at histology, or even looking at a picture of the earth, they're all just pictures. And the research questions and segmentation and counting and measuring, they're all pretty much the same research question. It's just when you commercialize that technology and try and get it to market, the silos and the ecosystems are very different. And the people you have to sell to, the way you have to approach those markets are very different. There's lots of great uh, digital pathology companies that have failed because of that um, go-to-market strategy and the adoption and not quite getting that right or not quite getting the right stakeholders in place. Uh, So it's not, to me, uh, digital pathology has never really been a technical problem. It's always been an adoption and business model problem. We've had the ability to answer many research questions in the space for for decades. It's just really getting to a point where it drives real clinical outcome improvements, real cost reductions, and the people that have to adopt it are willing to adopt it. Uh, But it's never really been a technical problem, at least from my standpoint, for a lot of the research questions that are out there. 
This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by DJT Solutions, your single source for all your digital pathology requirements, from consultation services to system requirements, including installation, training, and life cycle support. Since 1995, DJT Solutions, we are your best choice for your best results. If you have a new product, it's very often a matter of, you know, who are going to be your early adopters and how is this going to be used in a clinic? Specifically, which department is it going to be used in? And I think pathology has kind of been a tough nut to crack from, from that perspective because we're very much, you know, in love with our, our microscopes and, <laughs> you know, not, not much else. So let's talk about kind of bridging that gap between research and actual practice. So you talked about models and technologies to look at cell cultures and organoids which I think is a very hot topic in, in recent years, organoids. Could you tell us a little bit about how that works and how working out of uh, cell cultures is different? You know, what are organoids and how do they compare to actual samples from actual patients? Five years ago, five, six years ago, we went to the Society of Toxicology Conference in, I believe it was New Orleans. And this is when we were first starting the company and we were trying to get a feel for the landscape. And we saw a poster where there was an organoid and the center of the organoid was dark. And we asked the researcher, why does it look like a donut? Like, is the inside, like, not there? And they're like, oh, we can't image inside there. And we're like, well, we have this tissue clearing reagent, and we can. So we got into that space tangentially because folks were starting to adopt these. Five, six years ago, it was mostly academics. But in the last few years, almost every pharma and biotech company is actively interested in 3D cell culture and has a program of some sort in this space. Um, because of its ability to improve the in vivo relevancy of in vitro models and better predict what's going to happen in a more expensive model. And the part that we play in that space is helping those researchers get the most data out of these models. They can be quite expensive and if you're generating an organoid, for example, it could take you months and months to differentiate and get your model in a plate. And once you have that model, you don't want to just cut a section of it or you don't want to just dissolve it and get total ATP. You want to get all the data. You want to look at every cell. You want to look at what's going on. So we do a lot of high content confocal multiplex imaging. We're generating just a huge amount of data from a 96 or a 3D multiplex imaging. We're generating just a huge amount of data from a 96 or a 3D. If we have a, a liver model, for example, uh, what kind of toxicity do we have? Are the stellate cells being affected, the kupfer cells, the hepatocytes? Um, what's being secreted into our media and when. So we're able to get a lot of data from those models and trying to recapitulate what's happening in vivo in a plate. Um, there's a lot of different terminology. People call these models all different types of things. There's a bunch of marketing terms. The way we refer to them here is 3D cell culture models, and that encompasses your organoids, your spheroids, your micro tissues, etc. Organoids tend to mean models that are derived uh, from stem cells. Uh, definitions are still loose in the space just because it's so new, but that tends to be what you refer to as an organoid. And in practice, they can be hard to differentiate. They can be hard to validate. So we tend to hear a lot of times work with primary cells and cell lines and not so much organoids, but it's definitely still a new and emerging field. And there still really isn't a standard of practice yet in that space. I see. So do you think there's, there's clearly pluses and minuses to all approaches. Do you think there's kind of a, a sweet spot for cell culture and, and organite? I mean, what comes to my mind is you can grow it again. You have somewhat of an inexhaustible supply. You know, on the plus side, it's very good at looking at the expression of various proteins or DNA and RNA at the single cell level, you know, but then you kind of lose cancer we're learning has become is an increasingly complex disease so you lack perhaps cancer stroma or the interaction with normal tissue and probably most importantly the vasculature that runs through there so i think there, there's clearly pluses and minuses what comes to your mind in terms of the pluses and minuses and re where do you really see the the uh, sweet spot for your approach to cell culture and organoids at the end of the day, it's always a model. So folks, for us, they'll reach out and say, hey, let's do a, a NASH assay. So we're trying to simulate in a 96 well plate, polystyrene plate, a disease process that takes 30 years. We're trying to do it in two weeks. Right. And so the data you're getting, the concentrations you're using, they don't translate directly to what happens in vivo, and they shouldn't. It is, at the end of the day, a model that we're using for screening. And when I say screening, I mean more so if you have 10, 30, maybe 50 compounds, you're going to 3D cell culture models. But if you have 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 compounds, you're not using 3D cell culture models. They're too expensive. They're too complex. 
So it's another tool along that in vitro pipeline. It gives us one more step before we get into more expensive animal studies. And in some cases, it might allow you to jump past uh, some animal models, but really the whole goal is getting you to fail faster. And we're using these models to answer questions usually that we can't answer with 2D cell culture. So we're trying to understand how T cells are invading into a tumor. We're trying to understand if we have multiple cell types in a liver spheroid, how they interact with each other, which is something we just can't get. We can't get those more complex phenotypes and features in 2D. So that's really where they come in. There's folks that are trying to ultimately replace 2D, where we can show that 3D models are more accurate at predicting drug-induced liver injury, for example. Uh, but for us here, we're trying to answer questions that otherwise we really just can't answer. Something like NASH is where we do a lot of work right now. There's not great animal models. Um, using other types of like precision cut tissue slice models can be expensive. So these 3D cell culture models provide you a pretty good in vitro model at a pretty reasonable price point and we're able to get you know, excellent data from them and generate a huge amount of quantitative data. So it fills a gap, but I wouldn't be one of those people that says 3D is going to get rid of 2D and get rid of animal models. That's just not going to be the case. Yeah, now speaking of generating a vast amount of data, you talked before about multiplexing, which seems to be a big part of what you do. What is the state of the art of multiplexing? Where are we now, our ability to do that? How many you know, antibodies or targets can we visualize at a time does it make a difference if we're talking about 2d versus 3d you know where are we now where does the potential lie you know with multiplexing what's kind of the holy grail or the end game that you see it really depends who you talk to but for for us we refer to multiplexing is usually four or five um, plus markers per tissue and for us in 3D, I would say we tend not to go above four to five ever for 3D multiplexing. It just becomes prohibitively expensive to label a large piece of tissue in 10 or 20 labels just from how much antibody you're using and how much data you're generating. It just becomes too much. And there's a point where it's like, hey, we have too much data here. We're good enough with doing this in 2D or getting a couple sections or doing it differently. So usually in 3D, it's yeah two, three, maybe four or five markers um, just because of the amount of data that we're, we're getting. But in, um, in a two-dimensional context, so on a slide, there's a whole bunch of different approaches out there for doing multiplexing. There's bleaching. We use a technique in-house that we've developed for stripping, so we're actually denaturing antibodies, and we're labeling sequentially with multiple rounds of antibodies, co-registering the data, and creating a 10, 12, 15-plex image from a single slide. Um, for most of our researchers, that's enough. There's definitely folks who want to get 20, 30, 40 markers per slide, but we find those people tend to have more basic research questions. And once they narrow down their panels, then they go to five, six, maybe seven markers per slide. Um, but it's an amazing tool to allow you to survey a lot of uh, proteins all at the exact same time, all from the same slide. We can use relatively standard image analysis tools to then quantify that data and answer research questions. We can also use more complex um, machine learning and AI-based tools to try and tease out different types of insights and biomarkers. But most of the work that we do in this space is folks that are coming to us where they have a program, they're looking for a biomarker, they're trying to understand the interaction between multiple um, immune cell subtypes. It's very focused towards immuno-oncology, but there are researchers that we work with in infectious disease, um, in the liver space, um, and all, all a bunch of other spaces as well. But immuno-oncology seems to be the dominant type of multiplexing application just because of how many immune cells you want to look at at the exact same time. So I see it as, um, right now it's uh, preclinical, it's moving into the clinic. Uh, once we find some research questions and diagnostics that require multiple markers simultaneously, it will make its way there. How quickly that happens, I honestly don't know. I, I hope soon. I think it does allow us to answer more complex questions and um, uh, give patients a more specific treatment for their particular disease. Um, but for right now, much of our work is in the preclinical space for multiplexing. At least to me, it seems like it would be a pretty obvious approach to develop multi-gene or multi-protein classifiers that could actually be used in clinical practice. You know, moving away from this, uh, you know, bind and grind type approach to more of a spatial genomics or a quantitative multiplex protein assessment. So is there any, so along those lines, are there any uh, platforms or methodologies to multiplex that stand out in your mind as being particularly robust, you know, saying, for example, uh, fluorescent based approaches compared to pro chromogenic approaches that we use in IHC? Is there anything that appears, you know, in your mind to be more robust or that might have kind of the fast track for clinical use in a multiplex approach? 
they all sort of have their unique advantages and disadvantages. I think everyone wants to say, like, ours is the best. And I will say that ours is not the best because there's no technique that's the best. It, it depends. Our, the technique that we use is compatible with all antibodies. So you don't have to have special secondaries or special primaries, which is a great advantage um, for, for us. But every technique has its own unique challenges. There's some techniques where you can label 10, 12, 15 markers all at the same time. So it's, it's quicker, but then the probes are more expensive or more complex to validate. So they all have their unique pluses and minuses. With fluorescence, though, we're able to get probably the most labels per tissue. There's also imaging mass cytometry, which is a cool technique, and you can get 37 markers per slide, but that has some other trade-offs as well. So they're all, they all serve different purposes. I would say, though, if there is someone going to the clinic, it probably isn't going to have 30 or 40 markers. It's going to be a combination of a few. And I know there's a lot of money being pumped into the space in the clinic, but we still don't yet have a clinical question where using a multiplex diagnostic allows us to have a better outcome for a patient. And until you prove that, these really won't be you know, used out in a clinical context. So I would say there might be something with two markers or three markers, but having like a multiplex diagnostic panel with 10 or 20 markers, that's probably not going to happen in the short term here. So perhaps chromogenic might be good enough in the short term as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people may fall victim to that type of thinking. Well, if two markers is good, then 10 must be better and 20 would even be better than that. (laughs) But I think, like you said, it's important to keep the clinical question in mind and what practical question are you can you actually answer with your assay or or methodology? So, and then the other piece is, so now we're developing the technology to multiplex, and then how do we extract the data and quantify the data, you know, which is really where digital pathology comes in, and then we're developing also artificial intelligence types of approaches. Uh, So maybe tell us a little bit about your work with that at Physical. Yeah, everyone throws around the AI thing. I think it it brings in venture capital dollars and it's sexy. But what we know is that most of the questions that folks are asking really aren't that complicated. And like the preclinical field, a lot of our questions are looking at cell counting. So understanding which cells are where, how many T cells are in our stroma versus our tumoral area, how far have our T cells invaded into our tumoral area. So they're relatively complex but not complex, relatively simple spatial questions, and then understanding distribution. So if I have T cells over here and I have B cells over here, how close are they? How are my treatments affecting these distances and distributions? Um, So a lot of it is just statistical classification. It's segmenting out different cells, identifying who they are, where they are, um, and then comparing that. That's a huge amount of the work that we do. The more complex AI and machine learning stuff, we have questions, I would say, where we're looking for biomarkers that comes more into play. But most of the time, it just sounds really cool and people get impressed when you say that. But in practice, I would say that a lot of the, and most of the research questions that we're addressing don't require advanced image analysis approaches. There are some cases where we have to train algorithms to identify certain areas on slides or we're, we're working with pathologists to train a classifier to say, hey, this is the tumor area or this is the region of interest. And in that case, we are using those tools. But I would say most of the questions that we're looking at are pretty straightforward image analysis uh, questions. And along those lines, what about just good old-fashioned H and E morphology? I think it's 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 tempting to get excited about, like you said, artificial intelligence and everything that might be on the horizon at some point in the future, you know. But what do you think about just bringing uh, computational power to bear on old-fashioned H and E morphology? Everyone likes to like throw the pathologist under the bus. And I know I've seen studies where there's lots of variability between pathologists and a pathologist one day before lunch and after lunch looking at a slide. But for the most part, pathologists do a pretty good job at looking at H&E. And I think coming up with um, a computer program to do it for most research questions and most clinical questions, it's just not going to be better. It might be slightly more accurate or precise, but it probably in practice isn't going to change clinical decisions or clinical outcomes all that much. So I think that's that's an area a lot of people work in, but for me, it's not – it would be cool if you got rid of all pathologists and we had H&E just done by computers – but I just don't see that practically happening. I find that digital pathology is more useful in the questions that you can't answer today. Um, trying to understand things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to look at, like multiplexing. But trying to get rid of the things that we do really well today, that's a hard, that's a hard hill to get over. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is tempting, or it sounds good on paper. But I think, like you said, A, the pathologists have been very good at what they do for over 100 years. And then B, what we do is just infinitely complex you know there's 
in other there's so many different use cases you know it'd really be hard to train a system or an ai to take to take everything into account Dr. Michael Johnson from Visical, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, what, just before we wrap up, tell us what excites you and where do you see the field headed and specifically what you're doing in the next 10 years? 10 years is a, a way out. Um, for a small company, you don't need to think 10 years in the future. But for us, um, we here are growing a lot. We're profitable. We're scalable. We've been bootstrapping our growth and doing really well over here. So we, and our mission has always been since we started the company to have a real impact in the space. And we can say we have that today in the preclinical space. But for us, what we're trying to get to is the clinic. We're trying to actually improve outcomes for patients from technologies we developed while we were PhD students. That's really always been our goal as a company. And I would say in the next five years, we probably will do that. We have a couple programs that we're launching that will have that effect, either in multiplexing or in 3D imaging, which is super exciting. I mean, that is the goal of every scientist to have a real meaningful impact and to help patients that's just cool. I mean, that's amazing. It's great we're able to do that with technology and science. And that's why we show up every day. It's not to run a company or to, to make money. It really is to have a meaningful impact on the world. And for the space of digital pathology, I just hope we just have more accurate diagnosis for patients and we can drive healthcare costs down and have patients live more uh, longer and more meaningful lives. That's the whole goal of what we do here. Yeah, longer and more meaningful lives. That is a that is a very lofty goal. Our guest has been Dr. Michael Johnson from Physical. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. This has been Digital Pathology Today. Please be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening.